Welcome to the first episode of Military Armaments Company and it is our privilege and honor to bring as our first episode a national treasure and icon in the aviation world, the real Memphis Bell. Uh, so this is going to be a long line of a uh, series of videos conducting an in-depth look at the history, uh, the equipment and the crew that served inside this amazing plane. and. Um, you guys are going to enjoy it. You're going to love it. Stay tuned. Well, I was uh, I was one member of an absolutely fantastic team. Mm -hmm. um, I was the project manager and lead curator for the Memphis Bell Project at the National Museum of the United States Air Force. I was a curator here for about 23 years. Wow. And now I'm a senior historian in the Air Force's labs. Wow. So we're... we're Lucky to have you on with us today. Yep. All right, so before we dive into the Bell story specifically, uh, let's talk about why, why it even went over there. Like, paint the picture for bombing Europe uh, initially. So in the uh, teens, 20s, and 30s, there were air power theorists that talked about air power being decisive, that, that these future bombers could destroy an enemy's ability to prosecute war. You destroy their munitions factories, their ability to pr produce fuel and all those sorts of things. Now the British were conducting a bombing campaign at night and um, they had initially started bombing during the day but they took crippling losses. Well on the American side, the US Army Air Forces had developed uh, their entire strategy based on daylight precision strategic bombing. In fact, we committed aircraft, training, crews, that's the way that we were gonna fight the war in Europe. Mm. And that's where the Memphis Bell comes in. We initiated the daytime strategic bombing campaign in August of 1942. Mm -hmm. The Memphis Bell came along in the fall of 1942. And the whole idea was that we would have these bombers that would be able to protect themselves by having all, all kinds of machine guns on them. Yeah. They wouldn't have to be escorted by fighters. And they would go and destroy Germany's ability to produce war material and prosecute wars. So um, that brings to mind two questions. Um, other than the obvious, uh, why in one sense was daylight bombing more successful than nighttime bombing? Other than the obvious fact that you can see what you're going to hit. Were there other factors in there that favored daylight bombing? Those are great questions. So daylight bombing offered the promise of more precise bombing. Mm -hmm. So the British would bomb by radar at night, uh, sometimes called area bombing. Mm -hmm. Now with daytime bombing, the accuracy that the American bombers had got better through the strategic bombing campaign. At times, the accuracy was actually very poor. But the idea was that during daylight, that the bombs could be placed more precisely on German factor factories, oil producing facilities, and things like that. The problem, though, with bombing during the daytime is it was potentially more hazardous, that German defenses would be better during the daytime than they were at night. Although what's kind of interesting is that during the war, RAF Bomber Command lost about 55,000 killed, and their worst raid, they lost more than 90 bombers on one raid. So in the end, it really wasn't all that much safer to fly at night either. Hmm. But the American uh, uh, Army Air Forces was really set up to bomb during daytime. And in fact, there was a struggle about whether uh, the Americans would fly at night because with the losses that uh, the Americans were taking, especially in the first year of the bombing campaign, uh, there were some that were pushing that, that they should fly at night. But in the end, I think it, it turned out to be very complimentary with the British flying at night and bombing at night, mm. Americans bombing during the day, yeah. it created an impossible problem for the Germans to solve when they're getting bombed literally day and night. Yeah. It wasn't like the US turned up and said, we're gonna bomb by day. Uh, they were kind of configured and trained and all their R&D was done in the pre-war years and set up for daylight bombing. Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, yeah. so, um, the, so the, what is now our Air Force today was originally part of the U.S. Army. Yeah. And it was originally called uh, through the 20s and 30s the Army Air Corps, and then in 1941 it became the Army Air Forces. And all through this time, um, the, the Air Force was set up for precision strategic daylight bombing. 
with this idea that air power could be decisive. I mean, in, in a perfect world, they could maybe even destroy an enemy's ability to prosecute war without some huge battles being fought. You know, that was right. kind of the, the in, in, a, in a perfect world, that's what would happen. Mm -hmm. So America invested very, very heavily in aircraft, training, equipment. I mean, in many ways, it was kind of bet the farm. Yeah. And this is all theory. You know, this is all an idea. It had not been proven. Now, there had been strategic bombing done in World War I with Zeppelins and with aircraft, um, but, but never to the degree that America planned to prosecute this daytime precision strategic bombing campaign against Germany. Now, the, the British tried to tell the U.S., hey, we, you know, we tried some daylight bombing early in the war here in 1939. It didn't work out too well for us. But when you look at the British aircraft, the British heavy bombers versus the American heavy bombers, they're very, very different aircraft. The, the British aircraft had rifle caliber uh, defensive armament. They had half the number of crew members. American bombers, like the B-17 and the B-24, especially the B-17, were set up as the flying armored fortresses. Of course, B-17 is called the flying fortress for a good reason. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that with all this defensive armament and armor and these rugged aircraft, that they could fly during the daytime, fight their way to the target, destroy the target, and do this repeatedly over and over. Okay, so that kind of touches on why it's actually referred to as the daylight bombing experiment. They're kind of testing the waters with um, the theory that it's actually going to be effective. Do you know, uh, so, so when did the, the daylight bombing for the U.S. actually begin, ballpark? So it, uh, it, it began uh, nascently in August of 1942. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot is made of, of the strategic bombing campaign, American strategic bombing campaign, and there's a thousand bombers in the air in these huge formations. That's later in the war. Mm -hmm. The bombing campaign evolved over time. Yeah. These early raids are 20, 30 airplanes, mm -hmm. and, and they're not going into Germany. Mm -hmm. They're hitting targets on the coast of France. Yeah. And, and there's a lot going on in this first year of the strategic bombing campaign because uh, Army Air Force's leaders are trying to figure out what's the best way to employ these aircraft? What are the best formations? Uh, how, you know, at what altitude should they fly at? All these different things, and at the same time, they're they're trying to preserve this small force and grow it. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't afford to lose 20% of their bombers. So there's an awful lot going on in this first year, and in many ways, it's, it can be likened to a bloody experiment um, because there was no other way, there was no other uh, data to go on since no one had done exactly what the Americans were trying to do. Um, so they're learning along the way, and of course the Germans get a vote too. Mm -hmm. So they're adjusting with their tactics and how they're dealing with these bombers. Um, but the first year of the campaign, a lot of that first year is really hitting targets in France, particularly the U-boat bases along the coast, and also some French aircraft manufacturing facilities that were producing uh, aircraft and, and uh, parts for, the, for Germany under duress. Okay. And um, how, how long till you think the effects of this strategic bombing were actually felt on the ground at the other end? Like, did they start to see lack of U-boats in the ocean, uh, a decline of planes in the air? Like, how, how long did that strategic bombing actually become noticeable? That's an excellent question. And, and it's really not until about early 1944 um, that we really see the impact of the strategic bombing campaign. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the B-17s, received something called Tokyo tanks, so they had additional tankage so they could fly further okay. and they could hit those targets further in Germany. But before this happens, the Army Air Forces is essentially defeated in the late summer and the fall of 1943 with catastrophic raids against Schweinfurt, uh, Schweinfurt Regensburg, and also against Ploesti. And the losses are so high that should they continue, the campaign really wouldn't be sustainable. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens is out of sort of the jaws of defeat, we see uh, fighters with long range droppable fuel tanks and the P-51 coming along. And now that's really the pairing that creates victory. 
Okay. It's B-17s and B-24s and fighters that can escort the bombers all the way to targets deep in Germany. And in the spring of 44, um, we see German uh, fighter pilots being killed in numbers in, at such a rate that they can't be replaced. And part of this is a deliberate policy, strike targets that the Germans have to come up and defend. And the result of that is when D-Day comes along, the German Air Force is nowhere to be found. The, basically, the, the Luftwaffe fighter force, the back of it had been broken. And without air dominance in Normandy, there is no D-Day invasion. Mm -hmm. uh, the Allies wouldn't have attempted it because it would have been catastrophic. So that's the first time that the impact of the daytime strategic bombing campaign is really felt. So that leads into my last question in relation to strategic bombing. Um, like forces are beginning to mass in uh, in the UK and, and, and get ready for this invasion. Um, you know, we didn't go from the US mainland and just invade the beach at Normandy. There was 18 months to a year of build up in Normandy. Uh, how did strategic bombing tie into the invasion? Did the strategic air command have like a go, no go um, condition for the invasion to begin? Like, were they working together there or? Air dominance was a fundamental requirement for the D-Day invasion. And initially, uh, in the early part of uh, the daytime strategic bombing campaign, the, the focus was kind of on the U-boat bases because of the terrible losses to Allied shipping, bringing supplies over from the U.S. But after they went through that phase, the most important, and some other strikes against ball bearing plants and, and oil producing plants, the primary focus for the American strategic bombing campaign was to destroy or break the back of the German fire force. And really the crescendo of this uh, goal was during something called Big Week in late February 1944, where a series of raids against uh, vital German aircraft plants brought the German fighter force up. Now, a lot's written about, well, they didn't you know, destroy the fighter production and fighter production kept going up. That's true. But they were killing German fighter pilots that couldn't be replaced when they came up to defend these plants. So it was a very deliberate policy to break the back of the German fighter force to then provide the air dominance that was required over Normandy to uh, uh, enable D-Day. Wow. So with that first uh, daylight bombing sort of phase uh, going right through the war and then into after the invasion up to Germany's surrender, at what point were the losses uh, the most catastrophic and why? So the losses were pretty terrible through the first year or so of the bombing campaign from August of 1942 to August and into the fall of 1943. For a crew member, an 8th Air Force crew member, the odds of finishing a 25 mission tour at the time were about 28%, or about one in four. And the other three would have been killed, shot down and captured, or wounded so bad they couldn't continue their tour. So it was bad. But the very worst part stretch was from the beginning of August and going into October of 1943. And, and at that point, the Army Air Forces were losing so many heavy bombers, the campaign was becoming unsustainable. Uh, strikes against uh, Ploesti, uh, which is an oil refinery area in Romania, uh, Schweinfurt, uh, where there were ball bearings made, and Regensburg, where there were important aircraft manufacturing plants. So these losses were so high that the campaign was basically unsustainable. And the reason why was because in the end, these heavy bombers, though heavily armed with defensive armament, they really needed to have fighter escort. And not enough uh, emphasis was placed on making long range fighters, but the introduction of the P-51 and the introduction of large droppable fuel tanks for aircraft like the P-47 and P-38 gave the range for fighters to be able to escort our bombers all the way to targets in Germany mm -hmm. and back. And that really spelled the death knell for the Luftwaffe and ultimately for the Third Reich. Okay.